My name is Jessie Doyle, and for this presentation on the hero's journey, I'm going to be analyzing The Mandalorian. Beginning five years after the events of Return of the Jedi and the fall of the Galactic Empire, The Mandalorian follows Din Djarin, a lone Mandalorian bounty hunter in the outer reaches of the galaxy. He is hired by remnant Imperial forces to retrieve a child, Grogu, but instead goes on the run to protect the infant. While looking to reunite Grogu with his kind, the Jedi, they are pursued by Moff Gideon, who wants to use Grogu for his connection to the Force. Some background on our hero. When Din Djarin was a child, his parents were killed by Separatist battle droids during the fall of the Old Republic. He was rescued and raised by members of the Mandalorian Fighting Corps, therefore becoming a foundling. Mandalore, the home planet of Mandalorians after years of conflict, had fallen to Empire control. The genocide of the people of Mandalore by the Empire is often referred to as the Great Purge. It is unclear if Jaren ever spends time on the planet Mandalore or if the Fighting Corps raised him nomadically. Mandalorian refugees are scattered throughout the galaxy and they seem to get by by working odd jobs. They congregate in secret to practice the ways of their creed. They honor ancient Mandalorian traditions such as melting down a metal called Beskar to forge their armor. Jaren eventually settles on a planet called Navarro and joins the tribe, a community of Mandalorian refugees who follow the ways of the Children of the Watch. Jaren subsequently takes the oath to become a Mandalorian himself. We find out later in the series that the Children of the Watch are considered by some Mandalorians to be religious extremists. They strictly adhere to their creed, or as they call it, the Way. One of the tenets of the Way is that a Mandalorian must never remove their helmet in front of another living being, or else lose their status as a true Mandalorian. Mandalorians are rare enough, even on Navarro where the tribe resides, that the main character's armor and fighting style seem to have an intimidating effect. Few bother to learn his name, or he may not offer it, so he's often referred to simply as Mando. When the story begins, Mando has been working as a bounty hunter for some time. He receives his payment in bars of Beskar, a metal that is sacred to Mandalorians, and lightsaber proof. He's been slowly assembling a full suit of armor with the help of the tribe's armorer, who also acts as a sort of priestess and spiritual guide. The series follows several markers of the hero's journey and its creator, John Favreau, has stated that he was influenced by Joseph Campbell's teachings when writing it. The call to adventure would be when Mando is offered this new mysterious bounty with ties to the Empire. The refusal of the call is twofold. Mando originally is reluctant to take the job, uh, but then when he does take it, he originally intends to deliver the child to the client and only has second thoughts when he discovers that this bounty has ties to the Empire. You can definitely see him struggling with whether or not to do the right thing. As a Mandalorian, he has to kind of mind his own business in order to survive, but he feels a strong pull toward helping this child. In the process of retrieving the child, Mando realizes he will have to cross a desert planet and the only way to get across is to ride. This is where he meets the mentor character, Quill, who teaches him how to ride and also bestows some knowledge about ancient Mandalorians. He's very wise and a handy mechanic as he reprograms IG-11, a bounty droid, into a nurse droid to help him care for the child once he's retrieved. He is ultimately killed by Imperials, who take Grogu back. The goddess in this series would be the armorer who works for the tribe on Navarro. She instructs Mando on how to preserve the way and provides him with boons of upgraded armor, weapons, and even a jetpack at the end of season one. Other helpers who come along include Cara Dune, a soldier, Peli Mato, a mechanic, and Grief Karga, who acts as a shapeshifter character as his loyalties keep changing between the Empire and Mando's team. 
The Mandalorian crosses the threshold when he has to decide whether to incur the wrath of the Empire in order to save the child. There's some wonderful visual representation here with a literal large stone threshold at the entrance to the city on Navarro. The Monster of the Week style of the show um, introduces lots of challenges and temptations. Every week he's facing a new challenge to getting Grogu home. One episode that I find especially symbolic is one where he has to reunite with one of his old crews to pull one last heist and these characters act as a sort of shadow self as we see how far Mando has really developed his character since he worked with them. A temptation is when he hides out on a planet called Sorgan for a while and he meets a woman named Omera. You can see that he really contemplates revoking his Mandalorian oath, taking off his helmet, and living a life with her there. His symbolic death and rebirth comes in the season finale of season one. Din Djarin has a lifelong mistrust of droids since they killed his parents. Uh, he also has not removed his helmet since reciting the creed of rite of passage and becoming a Mandalorian. No one has seen his face since he was a young foundling. There is a moment in the season one finale where Mando is badly wounded during the rescue of the child his only companion at the moment is the bounty hunter turned nurse droid IG-11. The droid insists that in order to keep fighting and ensure the child's safety, the Mandalorian must remove his helmet and receive treatment for his wounds. The droid points out a loophole in the creed by stating, I am not a living thing. Mando allows his helmet to be removed momentarily. This is the first time that the audience sees his face. By allowing this, he narrowly escapes death, but this moment is also the symbolic death of his isolation, and also maybe his hatred of droids. This is also a belly of the whale moment as Din Djarin escapes the literal abyss of an old imperial base surrounded by lava canals. He gets out with the help of Grief Karga, Cara Dune, and IG-11, who sacrifices himself so that the rest can escape. This is a big change from Din's signature style of fighting alone. With the child back in his possession, the Mandalorian pays another visit to the goddess, the armorer. She crafts more Beskar plate armor for him and adorns one of his pauldrons with a new family crest. You will be a clan of two, she says to the Mandalorian and the child. You will be father to him. She gifts him with a jetpack and the transformation is complete. Because the show is ongoing, The Mandalorian hasn't really had his return phase yet. However, it could be argued that he always had a somewhat nomadic existence. In season two, we find him somewhat back to business as usual, but this time with the child in tow. Also in season two, we finally get our dragon slaying moment. And no, I don't mean the episode where they literally kill a dragon. I mean the show off with the big bad, the atonement with the father. Moff Gideon is the big bad of the series. He's definitely the Darth Vader of the Mandalorian universe. He possesses the dark saber, an ancient and legendary weapon traditionally wielded by the ruler of Mandalore. So Moff Gideon's symbolism is twofold. Not only does he possess an ancient relic of Mandalore, which he should not have, but he is a member of the Empire and therefore kind of responsible for Din Djarin's parents' death as well. Spoilers for season two, but Din Djarin defeats Moff Gideon and retrieves the Darksaber, kind of finally putting closure on the fall of Mandalore. Gideon has further symbolism as a father figure as his pursuit of the child is a stark contrast to Mando's role as surrogate father. I think this rivalry falls under atonement of the father because it allows Mando to put his past to bed and move forward with his new found family. The Darksaber itself could be considered the ultimate boon, but I think it's kind of a red herring. As a Mandalorian, Din Djarin has sworn to uphold the way. 
he thinks his ultimate quest is to restore Mandalore, and he is doing so by retrieving the Darksaber. But the journey that will bring him true bliss is that of family and fatherhood. For the analysis, I'll be explaining how the television show portrays the values of the group over the values of the individual. The show is still in its early stages, and it seems that future seasons may not be following Din Djarin's storyline further due to some casting issues. However, I think the overall moral of The Mandalorian is found family, and not just found family, but questioning the morals of the generation that raised you in order to raise a better future generation. Jaren is faced with the realization that the community that raised him may be too strict. Throughout the series, he has to loosen his grip on Mandalorian traditions in order to protect the child, Grogu. There is a clash between sticking to tradition and building a life that will truly make him happy. More spoilers ahead. In the finale for season two, Din Djarin successfully delivers Grogu to the Jedi. A young Luke Skywalker shows up and promises to instruct him in the ways of the Force. It's bittersweet, and it seems the Mandalorian is headed back to Navarro to resume his job as a bounty hunter, where he wasn't really happy or fulfilled to begin with. For all of his attempted preservation of Mandalorian customs, Din spends a lot of time away from other Mandalorians. I think he adopts this identity so that he can claim community without being vulnerable. He clings to it because it's easier than fighting for what he really wants, a family. I would much rather see an ending where Din officially adopts Grogu, maybe moves to whatever planet where Luke is establishing a new Jedi temple, finally takes his helmet off and lives out the rest of his days with his found family instead of in isolation. But here we run into conflict with the Star Wars canon itself. In order to be trained as a Jedi, Grogu will be expected to let go of all familial ties. Jedi tradition dictates that bonds like love are weaknesses that lead to corruption like Anakin Skywalker was ultimately corrupted due to his love of Padme and desire to keep her safe. However, in Return of the Jedi, it is those bonds that defeat the Empire. Luke's love for his father is able to break through Emperor Palpatine's hold on Darth Vader. He develops a bond with Leia and later discovers that she's his sister. Leia falls in love with Han Solo, and it is those bonds that keep them fighting. Will Luke rewrite Jedi law in order to allow familial bonds to stay intact? In the latest Star Wars trilogy, it seems like he may have, as Leia and Han have a son, Ben or Kylo Ren, and it seemed to be implied that they were still part of his life after he started his training with Luke. I hope future seasons of The Mandalorian help fill in those gaps of what happened in the years between the trilogies. It has all the makings of a found family show, and I really hope that there is a happy ending in Din and Grogu's future.